Hello, everyone. This is Nina Olson, the Executive Director for the Center for Taxpayer Rights, and this is our second tax chat in the series Transforming Tax Administration, um, funded by Arnold Ventures, and we're really happy to have you all here. This is um, what some might think to be a very dry conversation in the sense that we're going to talk about the IRS budget, but looking at what's been covered in the press lately and just the whole issue of the funding levels of the IRS, I don't think this is dry at all. Um, we are really fortunate today to have some excellent speakers. Um, well, they're not speakers, excellent members of our chat, our conversation. I'm going to start with Mark Mazur, who is the former Treasury Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy and also the former IRS Director of Research. Ursula Gillis, who is the former IRS Chief Financial Officer and has also been at OMB, the Office of Management and Budget. Um, and Jessica Lucas Judy, who is the director, tax issues, the strategic for the strategic issues team for the government accountability office. And um, what I'm really looking forward to in this conversation is to have an ability to walk through, we're going to start by walking through the IRS 2024 budget in brief, just so everyone can kind of see the breakdown of IRS budget categories. And then we're gonna go into a wide ranging conversation that um, will include just a whole number of topics um, and, and touch on the IRS strategic operating plan and some of the various things that we're all looking at. The format of this is that, you know, the guests on tax chat really get a chance to talk and um, you can put your questions in the chat um, and we'll be keeping an eye on that while we go along so that we can, you know, introduce them as we're having this chat. So feel free to ask questions. And if we have time at the end, we will, um, you know, call on people to ask questions. So um, I'm going to do a screen share right now so that we can all look at um, the IRS budget in brief and, you um, just have a good idea about what is going on here. Um, so this is from the 2024 budget of brief, and I'm going to turn to um, Ursula to really, you know, we can talk through some, some high level issues and then go deeper into it. So what you're seeing with this chart is um, what the, the columns are representing what the IRS had in its plan um, for 2020, fiscal year 2020, and what actually was spent. And then what you have for fiscal year 2023 is um, what was enacted um, because we're in fiscal year 2023. So we don't know precisely how much the IRS is going to spend. And then fiscal year 2024, you have the columns of what the IRS, the president has requested from the IRS. And you see FTE, which stands for full-time equivalent, which is roughly the number of employees, but maybe not because some employees, the actual count of employees might be different from the full-time equivalents. You may have some part-time employees, seasonal, et cetera. And you also have here the, the, the column that will show you the change between fiscal year 2023 and fiscal year 2024. And so I'm just going to start at the very high level, which is to take a look at the bottom line, which is in black, total budgetary resources. And you can see that what between 2023 and 2024, the IRS is requesting basically $20, $20 billion. Um, and it is, um, because these are zero, zero, zeros, um, and it is uh, uh, asking an increase of 15% in the FTEs and a 25% increase in the amount. And that's for their total budgetary resources, which is a significant increase. And that is on top of the Inflation Reduction Act money. So Ursula, do you want to sort of talk a second about, you know, some of the big categories that are in this chart and what they represent, what we're looking for? 
Sure, Nina, but first I'd like to say that that 25% increase is not a requested increase in their budget because it does include the money that they expect to spend from the um, IRA funding. So okay. if, if you go up to the subtotal of new appropriated resources, what they're asking Congress for is almost 15% increase. Right. Okay. Um, right, good point, yep. Okay, um, well, first of all, I think what most people really need to understand is the IRS gets its um, funding in four, four different buckets. There's taxpayer services, there's enforcement, there's operations support, and there's business system, mod business systems modernization. Now, one of the things that I was immediately alarmed about when we got the um, IRA funding was that Congress would use that, or maybe the administration would use that as an excuse to make big cuts in some of IRS's funding accounts, and that's exactly what happened. They notice that in 2023, there's nothing for business systems modernization. And the reason why that's a problem is it's very, very difficult year to year to get increases in your appropriated dollars. And part of that is because, you know, the Congress has a top line level that they decide they're going to they're going to spend a certain amount of money. And sometimes, and I'm not sure if it's still the situation, it was actually in, enacted in law what the top line number is. And then you've got 12 appropriating appropriations subcommittees, and they each get a chunk of that top line, and that's called their 302B allocation. Now, within the financial services and general government subcommittee on appropriations from which the IRS is funded, you know, they'll have a, a total amount, which will probably not be much different than the year before. And IRS is one of the big dogs in that account. GSA, I think, is the other one. And it's very, very difficult to get a sizable increase because where is it going to come from? Um, most of the accounts in that uh, subcommittee are small ca cats and dogs, very, very politically sensitive. Uh, you could zero a whole bunch of them out and still not be able to get the kind of increase the IRS wants. So it's very dangerous um, to put yourself in a situation like we just did in 2023 um, because the, the chance of getting $289 million increase in business systems modernization strikes me as just about zero. Um, I don't know where I was going with this, but um, the other thing that we need to know about these different accounts is that the IRS can, with congressional approval and, and administrative approval, transfer funds between the different appropriation accounts. But you also notice in each appropriation account, they have subcategories. These are called budget activities. And they are only allowed to move $5 million or 5%, whichever is less, between these different accounts. So you not only are you stuck with the total amount for enforcement, but you're also stuck with the categories, investigations, exam and collections, and the regulatory functions, foreign operations support, infrastructure, shared services and support, and information services. Shared services and support would fund things like the CFO, the uh, commissioner's office, um, human capital office, et cetera. And Ursula, when did that restriction come in? It, that, you... that res well, the restriction between budget activities, I'm not sure, that's, that's kind of been there forever. The restriction between accounts um, came in in the early 90s because IRS was a little bit too um, free in uh, transferring funds between accounts and some staffers on the Hill got pissed off. Um, let's see the other thing to notice about these accounts is that the um, most of the money in most of the accounts is annual money it has to be spent within particular or obligated within the current fiscal year uh, although in operations support there is a larger chunk uh, especially for information services that is, is multi-year money so that it doesn't have to be obligated right away and business systems modernization if I believe I believe is usually three-year money. So they've got three years to obligate it. And that makes sense because you don't want to start a project 
in IT that you can't finish. And so the budget rules require you, you know, of course, we sort of screw it around this sometimes, but they want you to obligate the full cost of the project up front so that you know you've got enough money to make it through and you don't have these, these projects that all of a sudden die because they ran out of funding. So here in this other category under other resources, you've got a line for unobligated balances from prior years. And um, certainly for 2022, that was significant because that's a prior year. You're not done with fiscal year 2023. Um, you know, what happens if you have an unobligated? Are you able to carry it over? or what You're does able it to carry it happen? over if it's multi-year money. Okay. Um, and if it's if, not, it just goes back to the public. If it's funds. not, it goes back, it goes back into the general fund. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And on average, what, I mean, has the IRS been able to obligate funds on average? Yep. Mm -hmm. We, um, well, last I knew, we did a damn good job um, obligating uh, just about every, every resource that we had available and not leaving anything on the table. And yeah. uh, that's uh, much thanks to the CFO budget staff that really keeps an eye on these things. Right. So, you know, some highlights to look at one thing that we were looking at, if you look across the line of filing and account services, that would include submission processing, you know, and processing payments and things like that, you see a very large increase between, even before the Inflation Reduction Act, between um, 2023 and 2022, a 21% increase in the FTE and a 30% increase in the amount. Um, and I think later in the discussion in the budget in brief, they talked about um, saying that that part of this was to uh, to um, really um, improve the level of service and also to keep on top of um, the uh, the paper because as you increase phones, often paper goes down because it's the same employees. Um, that work both paper and the phones. So I thought that was interesting. And then well, one, of the, yeah, go ahead. The other thing you, you need to keep in mind though, that is there is 838 million and 7,394 FTE in addition to that amount for 2023 that's being spent from the IRA fund. Right. So right. it's it's not as, as, as a, huge uh, increase in um, activity levels as, as it would seem just from the appropriated amounts there. Right. It said that um, in the description, the IRS says, although the IRS did receive $3.2 billion in IRA for taxpayer services, IRS will spend $800 million just in FY 2023 to hire additional customer service reps to enhance the level of service and reduce the paper backlog. And at that pace, we anticipate the IRS will exhaust all IRA taxpayer services funding in just four years. So they're flagging in the in the budget and brief for 2024 that, you know, they've already spent money in 2023 and they're planning to spend money in 2024 and they will basically run out of that extra IRA money for taxpayer service, you know, and I guess and in two years. And that's, when we, and that's when we worry about walking off a cliff. Yeah. Because um, you're, you're going to need to get a substantial increase in appropriations um, to maintain the staff that you've brought on board with this IRA money. And it's, um, right. it's, quite, um, it's quite worrying. Yep, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there anything else on this chart in particularly we want to look at before I go off screen? No, I just would have been interesting to see a, a chart that had for taxpayer services the full amount that we intend to spend for taxpayer service, you know, adding in the IRA funding and user fees that we're planning to allocate to that. So we can actually look at real levels of activity. But, you know, for, from Congress's perspective, since we were requesting the money, they do need it this way. And this is a um, format that is required by the Treasury Department to present it like this. There is an initiative under there to improve, and I don't think it's on this chart, 
um, but it was to improve competitiveness and effectiveness in IRS clerical staff. And although it didn't increase any FTE, it had an increase of 44 million this year. And what that was is to increase the grade level of the employees fundamentally in like the the submission processing pipeline. You know, the uh, one of the one of the things that COVID showed was how difficult it was to hire in these starting level positions. Um, which required employees to come in to process returns and things like that. And so they're, they've uh, obviously done a, a study to show that these jobs actually think, require more. I mean, I thought this was, this was mainly a, um, an enforcement activity um, for clerical staff and, and those organizations. They say that the new, they, um, the, that um, uses clerical staff across a range of programs um, and uh, they've kept behind and are lagging. And they say the new clerical positions are classified as a higher at a higher grade than right. most current that, 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 processing. Funding, well, maybe I'm reading. Do you think that's in enforcement but, only? I, I'm looking at a total for that of $167 million. Does that look, ring a bell with you? Where do you see that? I'm looking at the table on page five. Okay. Well, and, and one thing I would note, you know, while we're yeah. thinking about this is, um, you know, G GAO has been looking at the at the budget at IRS's budget over the years, and and you know so, something Ursula that you said, and in, um, in terms of you know being able to see sort of how all these pieces fit together, that's something that we had noted as far back as at least 2016 and maybe earlier that um, the the budget requests don't necessarily align clearly with you know the strategic plan and you know now we've got the strategic operating plan <laughs> looking forward um, and it's really difficult to sort of know just from those those buckets what um what particular initiatives are being funded what what's being spent on them currently uh, what's been spent on them in the past and how does that compare to the budget request and so you know getting a little bit more transparency a little right. more clarity in even how they present the information both to the public as well as to the appropriators um, you know, is, is something that would be very useful. Well, I, I suggest you reach, anytime you run into situations like this, you reach the, out to the IRS's budget staff and just ask them to pull together a table that shows it to you that way. Because this, this format right here is a, a format imposed by the Treasury Department, and it sort of corresponds and lines up with the way all the other Treasury bureaus are, are formatted. And because IRS is, has, you know, has user fees and other things going on that the other bureaus don't necessarily have, it, it leaves a lot to be desired in terms of um, presenting a, a very, very clear picture of what's going on with the IRS. So, you know, what I was looking at was this under technical base adjustments, improve competitiveness of IRS clerical staff. And that's okay. under that 44 million is mm -hmm. under taxpayer services. Okay. And then there's yeah, I guess I was looking at restoration of staff. Yeah. Well, that's obvious. Yeah, you're, you're, you're yeah. Right. and that's all enforcement. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I had thought that the improve the competitiveness of IRS clerical staff also had something to do with, um, well, maybe that's, no, that's change in staffing designation, um, trying to make people full time, which makes so much yeah. sense. Because and that was that's a, really an important provision right there. So I mean, just for the, the viewers, you know, for filing season, often the IRS historically was hiring what they would call seasonal employees that would come on before the filing season, get trained up again, and then and then be let go by June something of every year, if not May, but to just deal with stuff that was coming in attributable to the filing season. And that worked. And there were actually employees that that you know, people that came back year after year after year, but, you know, after, as, as things were getting more challenging and certainly with COVID, you know, nobody wanted to do the filing season stuff and, um, and wages were not competitive. So this position change in, in staffing designation was that they've designated a certain positions. It's not so much the FTE as it is that they're going to make them full-time employees and that brings on benefits and things like that. Do you want to comment on that, Ursula or Jessica? 
Oh, my comment's been, I had been arguing since forever that we should be trying to make these people full-time people and that there's certainly other work that we can find for them to do in other parts of the year. It's, it's crazy lo losing people that have been trained. Um, most people want full-time jobs. And, uh, you know, I just, I'm just very glad because I think this is going to be good for the IRS in the long run. Yeah. 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 That, you know, ability to be able to, to meet the surge capacity each year. Yes, it makes sense to have some seasonal employees, but then they keep ending up in the same place every filing season. Like you said, Nina, of having to, you know, work the correspondence and then switch over to the phones and then you get a backlog on the correspondence and then the phone service goes down. And, you know, so being able to move back and forth, we've also um, found that the IRS relies a lot on, on overtime, sometimes mandatory, sometimes voluntary. Um, and that's fine. Again, that's a that's a you know a tool in the toolbox and one that that should be used. But having a more strategic approach, um, we think, would be helpful both to avoid burnout among their right. the the people who are in the work, uh, but then also just you know be able, better able to manage the costs as well. Well, you know, for years I was saying, you know, the IRS said, well, these are employees for the surge. And I thought, what time of the year does the IRS not be, is handling a surge? There is, it's like a surge in one thing. And then that you take, it's like the whack-a-mole, you know, one thing goes down and then another thing comes up and then you've got to, so being able to and it, utilize these employees in that flexible capacity, I think will just be good all around. Um, Mark, you've been fairly and uncharacteristically silent. <laughs> so anything you want to add to all this discussion before I take it off? No, I just think that it, it, it's important to, to uh, emphasize the, the point that Ursula was making in that if you look at the ramping up of these activities, um, the budget goes through fiscal year 2024, but you sort of need to keep in mind what's going to happen in the subsequent years. Um, because the IRA money, the $80 billion of multi-year money um, will um, be, be spoken for. And then you have to figure out, okay, well, what are we gonna do in, in the out years? Yeah, you know, um, a little later on, there's a discussion. It, behind this chart, then each page discusses what, at a very high level, yep. frustratingly high level, what each of these things are. And on the improved telephone level of service and reduced correspondence inventory, some of the discussion is talking about that they're projecting a level of service on the phones of 85 for 2024, of 85% during the filing season and 80% for the entire fiscal year, which is actually to me a very good sign because yeah. often what you would see historically was that the IRS would get 70% or maybe 75% during the filing season, then it would plummet to 42% or 50% for the whole fiscal year, meaning no one was going to answer the phone mm -hmm. and they were all dealing with correspondence at that point. Um, so keeping that high level throughout the year is a good thing, but then they have this little paragraph. So first of all, the level of service on the phone, this is something that's gotten some attention in the press, um, and certainly Senator Collins asked um, Treasury Secretary Yellen about this at a hearing, which is that the level of service measure that the IRS uses, and this is really a high level definition, is basically the number of calls that calls that were assisted by a live assister divided by the number of calls that the IRS phone system gated to a live assister. And what that means is that that denominator is a subset of all of the calls that came into the IRS, you know, all over the place. And what And so it's not really what we have argued and the inspector general has argued is that that's not really a reflection of the taxpayer's experience because it's the IRS that is deciding. It's the IRS's system that's deciding, do you get to a live assister or do you get to an automation, an automated phone line? And the ton of people who are going to the automated phone line may want to actually talk to a live assister, but they may not get to that live assister. So we had been saying you need an alternate measure that shows the number of calls that get through to the live assister divided by all the calls that came in. And the combination of those measures will show you a broader picture of what's really going on on the phone line. 
And you also want to know the defaults and the abandons and everything like that. And you also want to know the number of callers who were repeat callers that, mm -hmm. you know, maybe went to the automated and then that phone number came back in on the phone line and finally managed to find their way through the assister. There's no way on the phone system to hit zero and get to a live assister. You know, the Irish doesn't let you do that. It used to, but it doesn't. So what they say in the budget of brief this year is that they're going to create an alternate measure called LOSA, which is for the automated calls. And what that is, is that it will be, um, they say 34 million taxpayers during fiscal year 2022 received an answer to their questions through automation. I think that's actually a misstatement. They were directed to an automated phone line. Did they get an answer to their question through automation? That's not clear unless the IRS does customer satisfaction surveys to find out, did you get an answer to your question on that automation or did you have to go somewhere else? You know, you the IRS doesn't know that. They just know that the taxpayer went through on that automated line. But they are talking about developing a separate measure for automation. I'm not sure it's the measure that I would have developed, but I wanted to flag that because I think that's, they say that um, the base year is they're, they're going to have one of the years. I think the baseline is 2023 this year. So I don't know if anybody wants to weigh in on that point. Yeah, I, I mean, it's important that they keep reporting the level of service. It's kind of this you know, chicken or the egg thing is that everyone wants to know what's the level of service they ask about it, because it is the one measure that's comparable from year to year to year that in the wait time. But definitely, it's not the best measure necessarily, it doesn't give you like you said, the full picture. And, and so having something like the automated line, at least gives you a little bit of information. Um, you know, as, as a as a caller, there, there also would be the question of um, people who call in, get to the automated line, maybe they do get an answer, but that wasn't the only thing they needed. Maybe they needed <laughs> multiple things. They're having to call back again to either go through the whole phone tree or finally get to a live assister. And so that's, I think, one thing. And then and then I know in both the, the budget and brief and then also in the um, in the strategic operating plan for the IRA funding, there's there's talk of you know developing more automated services and, and things like that, more online um, account information and and the ability to to interact with IRS that way, and that might help as well uh, with people who have multiple questions or um, or even a very simple question and just something that they just they just need a little bit of information and they don't have to sit there and wait online or on the phone. Um, and so, you know, that's something that we're going to be looking at with with great interest. You know, um, the Taxpayer Advocate Service in 2016 did a survey, a nationwide survey of taxpayers, and we asked them uh, about, we had a whole series of questions specifically about what channel did you use to get information? And did you get the answer from that information? Did you have to go to a different channel? And it was an iterative question. So we could track, you know, if they started on the on online, did they move to phone or did they move to, you know, what? And um, we were able to see that many taxpayers online did not get the answers to their questions and they went to the phone. And um, we were also able, we also tracked that with representative samples for low income and elderly and disabled to see, you know, whether there were categories that the different channels didn't work. It's a really good study, but I would say, you know, okay, so 2016 is a while ago now, and particularly with technology and usage being that as you're looking at these measures, I would think that going forward, and this sort of gets into research, Mark, that you need to do that kind of study, like a yeah. channel study, periodically, like at least every four years. And you also need to figure out, I don't know how, because you can't really do a customer satisfaction survey of people who are hitting online. You don't know who's going online. So you have to do it as a random, you know, until you could try it with, if you had taxpayer accounts, but if they're just going to the website, you won't really, you can't do a customer sat survey on that. You could actually send one out with five buttons or you something. Can doesn't tell you anything you can do a little bit of like the tell us feedback about your yeah how, how was your experience but you don't it you may not get the response rate that you that you want i think you needed the point you're making though is a good one in that the um irs research organization needs to 
um, in the upfront part, build in a lot of the capacity to be able to do these things. Either it's to see if the um, taxpayer got the, you know, is satisfied with the answer they got or got to a, to an answer they want, but also to to build in various measures of, you know, how successful these things are, and then use that as a way to further refine things. And one of the the difficulties you, you sometimes see with organizations is they latch on to something and then they just stick with it and then don't move, um, which I think is kind of Jessica's point about the level of service. It's like, okay, well, we're measuring it. We're going to keep measuring it because at least we have some time series, whether or not that's the, the right measure or not to be, to be using. Yeah. Jessica, you were going to say something? Oh, just about the, the pop-ups online. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, sorry, I don't know how the sound is since I had to switch over to my phone. So hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you sound good. Yeah. Well, so, you know, let's keep on this. At one point in the budget and brief, it said, you know, that the direct effect of enforcement is one to six. Um, and you've talked, Mark, about it being one to four, one to five, <laughs> and that's the direct effect. There is no measurement really of the direct effect of taxpayer service. Um, although, um, you know, Enforcement, direct enforcement dollars are about what two to three percent of the total revenue that the IRS brings yeah. in. You know, so that sort of goes to the artificialness of the budget categories. You want to talk about measuring the direct effect of either enforcement or taxpayer service? Sure, sure we can do both. So first on the the direct effect on revenues from from enforcement, um, the intuition there is just that, you know, if there's a uh, IRS audit or a correspondence or some uh, a collection officer shows up at your business, there's some activity that the IRS takes, they try to measure how many dollars come in as a result of it. And over a long period of time, if you if you look at these, these estimates, there's ranges for different activities, but um, on average, they're sort of in the four to five to one range, I think. Where the IRS is coming out now is their resources on enforcement have been diminished so much oh. that there's more opportunity out there <laughs> to generate enforcement revenue. On the other hand, I guess you can think of there being more uh, non-compliance. Um, and so the, the, the number's been bumped up a little bit to, to in the budget in brief to six to one. But it's not just enforcement that generates revenue, that the whole um, IRS ecosystem <laughs> The IRS system raises, you know, 97% of federal revenues. And so if you didn't have um, uh, all those other activities in there, taxpayer services, ability to file uh, online or, or on paper or whatever, you wouldn't be collecting all that revenue. So it's obvious that there's got to be some return to that service um, activity. I think the thing that's difficult is um, looking at on the margin, if you add an extra million dollars for services, what do you generate? And, and it's sort of hard to say because there are so many different possible activities you could be doing with that, with that money. So I think the intuition is that it should have a positive return, you know, probably at least uh, one to one or so, um, but there really haven't been precise studies to look at over a wide range of, of service activities, how well, how well they're doing. And I guess and one other thing is just to put a pitch in for the business system modernization. I think Americans are used to dealing with their financial institutions, um, either on their phone or online or um, various ways in getting answers fairly quickly. I think the IRS should, should have a goal to become you know, kind of like um, a medium financial institution in that kind of response. <laughs> Not necessarily the best, but moving pretty far up along from where they are now. Well, you you and I both came in in 2001 in the IRS, and they've been saying being a medium, well, they've been saying first class, best first class, exactly, yeah. <laughs> institution since 2001, and they still haven't made it, you know, that's sort of disturbing, but that's clearly what should be. Um, you know, I think what's really interesting about the, the taxpayer service, and I'd, I'd like, you know, folks thoughts on this, um, and, you know, whether that the the or it's actually the the what I did I did a, a I published a um, an article in the University of Pittsburgh Law Review recently that where I went back to the statistics of income 
and just looked at collection revenue from 1995 to 2021. And when you do it inflation adjusted and you compare it to the number of revenue officers, et cetera, you know, the collection personnel, it's essentially a flat curve. Mm -hmm even when the revenue officers during 96 and 97, you know, just plummeted. And then in recent years, as the number of revenue officers also plummeted, it's just like inflation adjusted re collection revenue just is even across, you know, maybe a couple of little peaks. And that to me was like, well, there's something, you know, regardless of the personnel, there's some kind of level that people pay after the fact um, out of fear of the IRS, um, whatever, but it seems very constant and it seems inelastic, like it doesn't seem to respond to the number of people you put on this. And I, I'm wondering what might be behind that. I don't know, you know. Nobody has any thoughts on that. <laughs> well, that's just really interesting, Nina. And, uh, you know, yeah. my research should probably really get a handle on that. But, uh, you know, from my perspective, I, I really think you can sort of look at the whole IRS budget as, as one thing and what's the return on having the IRS um, and, and including taxpayer service and operational support as part of that. Because enforcement by itself I mean, it needs the operation support people. It needs it needs all those costs, and it, it generates work for taxpayer services. It, it seems so artificial to look at it in a vacuum. Well, and that some of that, and and this has come up as we've tried to figure out well, where is money coming from to make some of these improvements that are in the strategic operating plan? But just for the taxpayer advocate service, we were put a hundred percent in the taxpayer service budget, but sixty-five percent of our cases were enforcement cases. You know, they were audit cases, they were collection cases. And you know you don't you don't get a good return on investment calculation. You know if you don't really calculate, okay, this audit start created work for the taxpayer advocate service, and when we're involved, there are two employees involved in that case, and you can just say, well, audits return on investment is what well, we're not going to change our little pittance. You know, office is not going to change the calculation very much on that, but it doesn't really reflect the work that's generated downstream. And I've been trying to think about holistic measures that would capture, you know, the whole picture of what an audit start does, you know, as it does to appeals, as it does to tasks, as it gets to chief counsel, if you're going to exam. And the same thing with collection. I don't know, Mark, whether you were trying to do anything of that when you were in research or? Uh, no, I think we were still, at the very primitive stages then trying to trying to understand what is going on holistically i think that you know again this is one of the areas where the irs should be beefing up their their resources and trying to understand what the implications are and i think the the, the points that, that you and us are making about the the downstream effects are, are are important it's also the upstream effects right in some sense the enforcement people need hr to hire them to train them they need to get uh, computers so they have the tech support and so on. Um, so it's it's larger than just the number of dollars that go to hire an enforcement person. However, um, the budget scoring of Congress that Congress uses has a different set of incentives, right? In the sense that they get kind of credit for revenue raised for putting money into enforcement, and they get little or no credit for money put into other other activities. Yeah. Ursula, do you want to talk? There is, there is a device that showed up in a lot of budgets, but I didn't see it in this year's one, but maybe it was lurking and it was hiding. But that was the program integrity cap that was tried for years. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I didn't notice it in this year's budget either, but you know, it goes back to the um, when I was talking before about how the appropriators get a pot of money and they divide it into the 12 different sub subcommittees. And so each subcommittee is like capped at a certain amount of money. They can't spend more than that. But if you have kinds of programs that will generate more money than they cost, you can get like a program integrity cap adjustment. Yeah. So that's yeah. like free money outside <laughs> of the caps. Yeah. Um, and IRS at some point um, was able to demonstrate the direct 
revenue generated by specific initiatives. And what's interesting is there are other government agencies that are able to calculate indirect effects and they get credit for indirect effects of their activities to put them outside of the cap or put funding part of their funding outside of the cap. So, I mean, I think there's, there's room for us to be creative and to develop studies and information that would help because I think that's the only thing that's gonna save us from falling off the cliff when the IRA money runs out. So would those other ways also enable them to get services money since we're we're in these categories? Because, you know, the direct, like you, you build enforcement. Well, then I know that, I know funds. that at least in some of the years when I was working in the budget shop, we included tail funding for, for the enforcement activities and operations funding for the enforcement activities as part of the initiative. So um, we just have to be creative and, and think about a way of selling this because it's a good story. Well, Jessica, where's GAO on all that? <laughs> we have been, have been uh, emphasizing the importance of, of trying to figure out return on investment. And I know sometimes you know that can get a little, um, secular or a little bit stovepiped, but, um, you know, just even thinking about even having information to be able to think about what the return on investment might be. I mean, we've had a couple of, of recommendations that we've elevated as priorities for a while, um, thinking about large partnership audits and just even um, how they categorize, you know, what, what large means. Is it just, you know, is it just everybody who's, you know, above a certain threshold or can you actually divvy that up into more meaningful categories so that you know what kind of results you're getting from, from various types of, of audits and make tweaks? You know, that doesn't get at necessarily the, the bigger picture of which part of IRS is somehow more important or generates the most return. And I think, you know, the ability to, again, to sort of, things back to to their strategic vision and to their plan and and which things are priorities and, and which ones are likely to have an effect on on their operations or on their employee morale and retention I mean those are important too right because you can't you can't do any of the things you can't answer the phones you can't process the returns you can't do collections and appeals and policy and regulation and all those other things. Um, if, if you don't have the employees. And so um, it's, all, it's all sort of intertwined, but definitely having, having better return on investment measures um, throughout. And, and that's something that the, the service I know has been working on. You know, I, I, one of the things that always frustrated me about data was, you know, looking at the statistics of income and you see, for example, how many math error notices were going out, but they don't have the data on how many math error, no the, the math error adjustments were ultimately abated. And, you know, we did a study that showed that for the dependent TIN math error notices, which would have been adjustments to dependents exemption, head of household, you know, um, EITC, child tax credit, 56% of them were later abated. And you just sort of think, well, if you had those two numbers, you'd sort of be going, well, what on earth is going on in this program? Can we refine when we're sending these notices out? That's one that's postage and paper, but that's also 56% of them led to phone calls or more paper coming in, et cetera. And I know the same thing with automated substitute for return. You know, the IRS publishes the notices about, you know, here's how many automated substitute for returns we did, and here's the dollar amounts, but they don't publish the abatement amounts. And when we started doing most serious problems on, you know, the ASFR saying, look at the abatement amounts, you know, you need to refine this program and do better selection of the returns. They actually stopped the that program one year and took it offline for about a year and a half to revise how they were doing it. I haven't seen any, you know, I, I'm not inside, so I can't see how well the program's doing. But I just thought even making some of those numbers more public. So, Mark, that leads me to, because I'm kind of migrating to performance measures and measuring 
but you know, how do how, who decides what goes into statistics of income, like the data book, the IRS data book that you can see mm -hmm. online? So the IRS uh, the IRS data book um, has a, a, a couple of sources, I guess. One is there, there's a lot of inertia. And so things that were measured last year are more, li you know, more likely to be measured this year. So there's that. People want to have a time series of things. Um, and then each of the um, heads of the operating uh, organizations get to um, look at that and say, you know, is this fairly representing what we do? And so there are some changes that get made over time, but um, it largely is, is similar from year to year. I think the the point you're making, Nina, about um, looking at the downstream effects of a lot of these activities is important, almost as separate separate research activities, or or maybe just collecting the the data for them and publishing it. But uh, you can imagine with the um, uh, duplicate uh, taxpayer ID numbers for dependents, um, looking at okay, well, how did these get resolved? These got abated. These um, you know, two parents or two people claim the same child, and so one got them and one didn't, or whatever the, the results are, as a way to, to then say, okay, well, how effective was this intervention at the beginning as you kind of look all the way through to the to the end? And, and I guess that's part of what uh, I was trying to get at earlier, where the IRS needs to build in a lot of the measurement plans kind of upfront so they can see what the, the, full, the full results are um, going, going forward. So we have a couple of questions that I want to um, bring in here. Okay. One is, will inflation make it harder to achieve the IRS's hiring goal? And I guess that goes back to that chart, that initial, that chart, which is mm -hmm. showing, um, you know, on page five of the budget in brief, and Ursula, maybe you can speak to this, where, you know, the IRS has this line that says maintaining current levels, and then it has a pay annualization and then a pay raise. So maintaining current levels, I thought that was taking the 2023 current levels and then using the inflation adjustment. Like what would it be to just maintain what we got in 2020? What would it take just to tread water? Just right. to tread and water. And so, that's over a half billion dollars. And the pay annualization refers to the pay increase you would have received in 2023 that, that gets paid in um, October, November, and December, right. <laughs> uh, and then the pay raise uh, that they expected for 2024 is the cost of the additional pay raise going from January through October, and then non-pay is just general inf inflationary costs of the other things that you buy, like health insurance or what? Yeah, uh, you know, I you know I can just say as you know when I as when I was the head of the Taxpayer Advocate Service, you know, during the years where the IRS's budget was being cut, you know, between 2010, et cetera, we were held stable at, we didn't get cuts, but the cost of inflation and just normal mm -hmm. inflation where it was very low and a 2% pay raise or a 1% annual pay raise mm -hmm. meant that we started the process. When I first came in in 2001, personnel costs were about 93% of my total budget. We were able to do travel for training and things like that. By the time you got to 2015 or something, personnel costs were 98 to 99% of my budget. There was, and that wasn't because I was hiring more people. It was because of pay increases and inflation, and it left next to nothing for us to do anything else with our direct with our budget mm -hmm. uh, and we weren't cut and so i think that that to to that question about making it harder to achieve the you know in the in the budget proposal they're trying to account for those things but that doesn't mean that they're going to get that from congress right, right. no i think one of the other things to kind of keep in mind too it's going to be difficult to hire in a tight labor market right so the irs will be competing with lots of other employee employers to try and make these hires you want to hire top quality candidates, high quality candidates, I think like an underlying um, goal should be try to you know, improve the average quality of the organization with every hire. So you wanna keep, keep ramping up. Um, and then you need to retain those staff and you need to, to train them, get them up to, up to speed to be doing things and then retain the staff. And that's gonna be a bit of a sea change to the environment you were talking about, Nina, which is pretty much trying very hard to keep our people on board 
by cutting training and travel and other things so we can kind of keep them there, you almost need to flip that a little bit. So to make more investments in your employees to right. ensure that you can attract high quality people and retain right. them and, and also um, attract high quality kind of managers and executives as well. Right. Well, and, you know, part of what um, we always had to deal with was the continuing resolutions, which drove everybody crazy, you know, that you don't get your budget until you're halfway through <laughs> the year. You can't hire people yeah. if you don't know what your full year budget is. And so what you're doing, I mean, in a taxpayer service, you're hiring people to get through the filing season, but you don't know how, whether you can hire them permanently or are you going, that was another pressure to hire them as seasonals, yeah. right? Because you don't know whether you can keep them on for the rest of the fiscal year. And then, you know, if you have a stable environment like, you know, TAS or enforcement or something like that, you know, you're going to hold off hiring except all but the bare minimum until you know what your budget is. And if you get that in February, you're running around hiring people, trying to get them on board at the end of the year, and then you're leaving money on the table. So at the end of the year, you're looking at things to spend stuff, you know, and to obligate stuff that should have gone to personnel, but you're not putting it to personnel because you haven't been able to hire the personnel it's a it's a we, cycle yeah, yeah and, and definitely, you know looking at the at the strategic oper operating plan for the for the ira funding that's something that that ga is going to be looking at because again another one of our of our priority recommendations has been on having a, a human capital strategy mm -hmm. long term and those skills gaps figuring out what the challenges are like things like you know the the cost of living increases and the difficulty of hiring in certain markets and, and getting the, the training that's necessary, um, you know, competitive salaries and, and having that strategy in place and then the, the markers along the way to be able to know how is this working? Are we getting where we need to go? Where do we need to adjust? So, you know, sort of marrying those up, the, the human capital plan, as well as the, the overall, now that they do have hopefully this, um, you know, long-term funding that takes away some of that, that year to year and so you actually can be strategic and thoughtful and proactive in terms of how, how you're doing that kind of hiring. But there's going to take a change in culture, Jessica, right? Because they haven't had to do that before. And so it really is going to right. be a, a, a shift in the way the IRS looks at, at things. Well, and the other thing that came out, I think, in the in the pandemic was, you know, the IRS had been working really hard to close campuses, you know, yep. where mail was being processed, all that sort of stuff, you know, to save on real estate. So you get down to, you know, there you are, Austin, a very high cost area, you know, you just closed Fresno a relatively low, you closed, you know, Cincinnati, a low cost area, and then you're complaining that you can't hire in Austin. And, you know, you understand why they wanted to close real estate because you can save money in that way. But I think that goes to your culture shift. You've really got to start thinking about where are you putting these operations and planning years out and thinking about demographic curves and stuff and, and things like that, which I don't, you know, you didn't see in some of those plans, you know, it, it was more just, we're going to close to save money. You know, if we close yeah. this space, we will save dollars that we can apply to personnel. And you understand the thinking behind that, but it's reactive thinking. It's not strategic thinking. Yeah. Um, before I really want to turn to the strategic operating plan and Jessica, some of the stuff that GAO is looking at, but um, Don has asked if someone can, can, go a little bit more into, and I guess that's you, Ursula, into the program integrity cap and how it intertwines with the appropriation. Sure, yeah, I did notice that question from Don earlier. Um, the idea is that the state administration proposes an integrity cap adjustment for the IRS. Now, in order to count that as free money that doesn't count against the cap, the appropriators have to appropriate the full amount in the base that the, that the um, administration has asked for. And that will sort of trigger counting the, uh, the stuff that's included in the cap as above and beyond the amount of money given to the appropriators for that particular subcommittee. So that particular amount of money will be appropriated, but it doesn't count against their allocation. Did that answer your question, Don? Yeah, I think that's good. And then Ursula, how does that free up that additional money? Well, money's everywhere. I mean, right. it's, no, but you, you appropriate like an extra 10, 
million to the program integrity cap, and then that allows you to spend an extra 30 million somewhere else? No, it, it, say the program integrity cap is providing say $50 million for the IRS to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And that's on top of say a $14 billion base budget request. If the appropriators appropriate the 14 billion, 550 million amount for the IRS, then the 14 billion counts against their cap and the 50 billion is free money. It doesn't okay, count it. against anything. So it doesn't rob it from someone else, which it is does always not rob it from someone else. With no. the cap, you know, are you going to take it from the courts? Are you going to take no. it from no, where are you taking it from? There are all these in each of these subcat sub you know appropriation subcategories under the cap. There are different competing, you know, right. entities. No, it doesn't take it from anyone else. Right. That's that's the it's beauty clever. of it. Because the, the logic yes. is that if you spend that fifty million dollars, you're going to be earning. $150 million more in revenues than you were expected to, or whatever, whatever the calculation had, happens to be. Right. And and my point was that because it was enforcement, because they can show the one to one plus something return on investment, that's what was always included in the program integrity cap. So you like, could but, do... but, you know, I, I do know the, the, some of the right program integrity cap adjustments that we proposed when I was in the budget did include money for taxpayer services and right. operation support. Right. Because but what I was saying was that you wouldn't come in and say, with a program integrity cap, we want to do a pure taxpayer service proposal. Um, that would if be you could generate the research that would show right that there was a return. Getting back to right. um, improve research, then yeah, you could. Right, but that's the challenge because it's hard. It, you know, we've all tried to show, you know, the dollar benefit, you know, that one phone call brings forward, you know, on the service that answering a tax law question generates this many dollars of revenue. Well, the thing is, since other government agencies have been able to use integrity cap adjustments based purely on the you know, not bringing the direct revenue, but their actions indirectly causing the program to save money for some in some way. I really think the door is open for us if we really do the research that we could justify. That is really good news. And I personally am going to run with that. <laughs> We need to do that research. Mark, do you want to weigh in on whether that research can be like, how would you approach that research? I mean, I've thought about this a lot. I don't know. What... No, I think it's challenging. I think that one of the, 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 the difficulties is, as you say, it's hard to associate a particular service activity with some additional revenue. Um, and there may be things where you can say, here's a particular thing that we've done and it cuts costs somewhere else. So maybe something like the where's my refund um, on the website has reduced, you know, thousands or millions of phone calls, and maybe you can count that as as savings. But in terms of like additional revenue showing up, it, it, it will be challenging to to um, develop those studies. Um, worthwhile trying to do it, but uh, but it will be challenging. Look, I think one of the things we ought to do is go and look at the other agencies across government to find yeah. out what kind of research they did to successfully argue for cap. That, that's cap a good point. point. So let's see, we do have a question that came in indirectly. What is the data on the impact of dollars directly attributable to enforcement staff activity on revenue received? Does it count only taxes in fact and when collected by the IRS or amounts determined to be owed and tax, you know, and assessed against the taxpayer that is um, including the amount not actually received from the taxpayer. So Mark, you want to take a hand? So it's supposed to be the amounts that are actually collected. Um, and so um, one of the difficulties in doing this is you have to track through from when an assessment was made all the way to here are the dollars that showed up. Um, but um, that's the, the, the goal of, of doing this, um, this kind of research. And there's a uh, part of the 
Office of Research, I think, that focuses on enforcement revenue and the information systems that support that. So, and it is when I was looking at statistics, like whenever you try to look at enforcement revenue, they attribute the revenue to the unit that generated it. So, like if it's an audit and and then that's audit dollars, that yeah. that dollars that were generated by it, is it attributed to appeals? Like if appeals is the one that does the ultimate assessment and then it's ultimately collected, does it is it attributable? It's supposed to be attributable to whatever started the process in motion. Started the process. Yeah. So, so I guess appeals would have a negative effect. <laughs> so with taxpayer advocate service. <laughs> yeah, okay. So we cost. Okay, taxpayer rights cost. <laughs> Fine. Well, and, and like I, am I trying yes. a lot of the med the actual measures at least um, end up being the amount, the additional amount assessed, like for, for audits and things like that, as opposed to the amount collected in part because it's supposed to be the amount collected and the enforcement revenue, um, okay. which is why it takes several years in order to come up with those, those actual numbers. Right, because things could then go through appeals exactly. and they could go in or have an yeah. some other um, offering compromise or something. Exactly, right. especially if you think of like corporate audits, like how long they can take, right, to be resolved. So we have a question. Um, if the IRS Oversight Board was fully functioning tomorrow, this is a great <laughs> question, how could it best be put to work for planning, managing, and implementing budget activities that aren't either be that either aren't being done now or are being done inadequately. So let me just for those of you who don't know about the IRS Oversight Board in the Restructuring Act of 1998, one of I think the most controversial and from my you know, I'm the convener of these talks so I get to impose my opinion you know, one of the one of the most important developments was to have create an oversight board of the IRS that would have some external folks actually looking at IRS operations, you know, people from business, et cetera, from different walks of life. Um, and Treasury also had positions on the oversight board. And one of the things that the oversight board was authorized to do by statute was submit a proposal or their comments or their own recommendations for the IRS budget to Congress. So you, and I think, you know, I always thought that was very important partly because the oversight board held the different functional units to account. We all as heads of office went in periodically. Um, the main business operating divisions like wage and investment, et cetera, even had monthly meetings with the oversight board. The smaller ones had quarterly meetings. My own organization had quarterly meetings with the oversight board where they looked at every single measure that we possibly had and what our work was. And they gave us charges like, well, go back and find out about this, or we want you to look at this. And then they were able to, based on that insider information, make their own recommendations to Congress about what they where they thought the IRS should be funded. And that's also important to know the IRS budget cycle. It's like, and we were going to talk a little bit about this because at least, you know, Ursula, myself, and Mark have all been part of this process where you you put in as a head of organization, you're creating your own desires and you're saying, okay, here, I need to hire this many employees to handle these many cases that are going to come at us downstream from the IRS doing this work upstream. And we want to do some additional upgrades on our own systems. And you put that all forward and then it goes to, it's reviewed by CFO and CFO comes back saying, you don't, you haven't any justification for this and go home and do your homework. And then we go do our homework and then we come back and then all of that's rolled to a big meeting or it was when we were there with the whole leadership of the IRS senior leadership. And you're literally going through and ranking each one of those proposals and initiatives and the dollar amount associated with it. And a couple of years, we were even given a little stickers and we'd go around the room and vote for everybody's initiatives. You could vote for your own, but you could also vote for <laughs> others. And um, 
then the commissioner would go off and work on that with the CFO. And then ultimately there'd be a proposal to treasury who would send it back saying, you have, you are not getting this money. Don't even think about it. Go do the following adjustments. Or they would come back with treasury with questions and then people would run around and address those adjustments. And then that would go back to treasury and then treasury would roll it up to their entire plan to OMB and OMB would come back saying up, oh, we want you to cut 2% across every single part of your budget, you know, or something like that. And then that would ultimately somehow make it into the president's budget. Um, and so you have that process going on. And then you have the oversight board being able to deliver its own budget recommendations. And so things that may very well have been floated by IRS folks saying, we really need this, may never see the light of day, but might be able to see it in the oversight board budget. But Nina, I don't think there is one instance of the oversight board having any influence on what happened with the IRS budget in the years. Well, that, you know, I agree with you. And I and, think- and it was just a huge headache having to deal, I mean, you, you, you have to deal with it meant, it meant you had to pull the budget together earlier and it added another layer of review and commentary in a process that's already rather arduous. Um, you know, unless the oversight board was really giving the business units meaningful advice on how to change their operations or whatever. So for, from not a budget perspective, but for some other reason, that would be the only reason why I would think it would be worthwhile bringing them up again because from a budget perspective I don't think they added any value whatsoever. See I think that's really interesting because I and I think I agree with you that toward the end I mean first of all the oversight board was completely like it was three people and then it was down to one person recently and but when I came on in 2001 I thought that it was an excellent board and that it was very active and it was really delving into the operations of the IRS and and holding IRS officials accountable and even up to you know I don't know 2010 there there were things that were they were I could see on the collection side, they would take our data and say, you know, Iris, look at this. What are you doing about this? And nobody else was doing that, um, demanding that accountability. But um, I don't know, anybody else want to weigh in on the oversight board? I kind of have a, a similar memory to yours, Nina, that there were times when the oversight board was effective. Um, I think from to, to respond to Ursula, I think when the oversight board thought they were like an additional budgetary organization, that's not very helpful. That's really not their job. And um, having them present a different budget or a different set of, of, uh, of um, objectives may be helpful, but um, having them create like a, a dueling budget just yeah. really complicates the process. And so, yeah. so that was a bit of a, a, a bit of a problem. Remember when they're focused on the business activities and really trying to keep people uh, accountable and having strategic measures and publicizing those measures so everybody knows what the organization is doing in terms of, of overall performance. I think that was a, was a net plus. Yeah, and I what remember about, that. Go ahead. What about GAO and TICTA? I mean, you know, they're, they're constantly reviewing the IRS and coming up with, coming up with recommendations. I mean, I often found- I think yeah, I, mean, I, I guess I view them as having, as having somewhat different goals. Um, I think the, the folks at GAO often are responding to congressional in, instincts and insights. And TIGDA is almost, almost seems more like on a gotcha mode that looking for things that are sort of um, well, yeah. that's, that's, <laughs> able that's, to get a good headline. <laughs> I think you've nailed it there, Mark. <laughs> I, think but it I, but I sort of thought the Iris Oversight Board bringing in kind of business perspectives and different yes. perspectives was just a different set of perspectives that was helpful. Well, yeah. and I also yeah. think one thing that when I was, when you know, uh, Rob Portman was always a big supporter of the Oversight Board, and he had some legislation that was trying to modify it a little bit. And one thing I said to him before he retired was, you know, if the Iris is going to get all this money for business systems modernization, <laughs> 
you know, it would be really great to say the oversight board has to have someone on it who has done business system modernization in a large entity from outside. So that that way you have someone once a month meeting with BSM, bringing the experience from outside saying, what are you doing? And can actually, you know, monitor it in that way. And but it's at a high level, but it's also trying to bring in some of these practices that may have worked elsewhere um, without, you know, that that's my thing. Jessica, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, the, the oversight board hasn't been in existence since I, or, or you know, active anyway, since, <laughs> since I started working in the tax area. But, um, you know, definitely the idea of it having, if, if it were to be active, it would need to have very clear roles and responsibilities so that it's not just duplicating or sort of sitting on top of structures that are already in place and, and you know working at, at odds and things like that. But but something that would have potentially this cross-cutting view um, yeah. to to get away from some of the stove piping that sometimes happens and, and in things like whether it be in business, business systems modernization and online services and web services as well as as customer experience and enforcement all those things you know sort of bringing that all together and and engaging with stakeholders which is something that we've that we've often said that irs itself needs to you know perhaps do a better job yeah, and that was the other thing that the oversight board would do. They would hold a hearing that would invite stakeholders to come in, you know, and talk about it. And the hearing would have a different issue each year. And they were the ones that also undertook the customer attitude survey that the IRS eventually took over, which found out, which was a very important study. Um, so, I, and all of that generated in those beginning years of the oversight board, they were, you know, it was fresh out of RA 98 and they were really thinking about what their role was. Mm. And, uh, yeah. Go ahead. So, Ursula, I think we've all voted, outvoted you. Um, <laughs> that <one> has... <laughs> well, you know, back in our, when they were developing RRA 98, the thought, thought was they take IRS out of the treasury department and then have an oversight board as sort of like the managerial board, but that didn't happen. And so you wind right. up with Treasury, OMB, JAO, TIGDA, and an oversight board. And it's just, you know, when is enough enough? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm in the camp of, you know, bringing the oversight board back in. And that, and that also goes to, you know, maybe having someone with human resources experience from outside, as we're talking about, you know, how you've got these heavy lifts, both on the IT and on the human resource side, what are your practices? And it, <clears throat> it, the thing is that it needs to be high level. It doesn't, you know, it, they're seeing information that most people don't see, and they should be bringing their experience to that high level information and being directional and saying, you know, have you considered this? Have you considered that? Or are you looking at this? We'd like to see this piece of information because you're not reporting on this. And this, in my business, this really tells me something. And it's that kind of expertise that, you know, the iris is pretty much a closed shop. So it doesn't, it wouldn't show that information to anyone unless they had an official role, you know, and, and the taxpayer advocate service doesn't do that. You know, I'm not an expert on HR. I can't weigh in on that. Um, so, you know, I can weigh in on collection, but I can't weigh in on HR, which brings up one thing that we were talking, and that one of the questions was, you know, what do you think, do you think that the IRS can, can really, um, deliver on replacing master, <clears throat> individual master file by 2025, which is in the strategic plan? And I will just say next week, next Tuesday, we are having a whole tax chat on IT and IT challenges. So I think I'll leave it to those people to answer that question. But it does go to the procurement issues, you know, that we've got, you know, we've talked a little bit about the HR issues that are that are being dealt with. But on the, you know, the business systems modernization side, where the IRIS really got into trouble back in the late 80s, early 90s was with their transformation project. And they spent, what, $4 billion and had next to nothing to show for it. Um, you know, and Charles Rosati talked about that on our previous tax chat. But, you know, that goes to, and so much of that run up was, you know, the, the, the contracting. I don't know whether, you know, Mark or Ursula, you want to weigh in on like looking at some of these contracts and the kind of oversight that needs to be done and whether the IRS has the capacity to do that. 
anybody want to Ursula, wait? you want to? Jump Go ahead, Mark. Uh, so I think I, I think it's important to to have the ability to to manage those contracts. I think one of the challenges that you have sometimes where you're doing things that are um, new and different is that um, you you almost have the contractor managing the agency um, rather than the reverse and. Um, so it really means that there's an important role to have um, the oversight of the contracts and have the expertise in-house to manage those, those contracts. And that's an area where, again, the IRS is probably a bit deficient at this time and will need to, to hire up in, in those areas. And one of the things that brings up in their, their budget, they're asking for critical pay authority so they can actually pay more than the GS or executive scale for for these types of of resources, and it's probably as important for them to to have that ability. Yeah, it's really hard to make that case for HR or business, you know, or for procurement. You know, like if you're hiring an employee in procurement, but you may need someone who's really knowledgeable about IT to watch out for those overruns, challenge what the the contractor yeah. is saying. And and push back and and you know maybe Jessica you want to say something back there because you all are doing oversight on these contracts and things. Yeah, yeah. no, my my colleague Dave Hinchman will have a whole lot to say about this uh, next week's chat. Um, but you know it is it is not just an IRS issue. This yeah. is a this is a government wide issue. This idea of of making sure that you have good management in place, practices in place for procurement and contracting. Um, making you know having very clear uh, deliverables, realistic um, costs and schedule, and again, just you know that monitoring of making sure uh, when things are slipping that that you have the the flags in place for someone to even notice that that's happening, um, and and transparency in in reporting. Um, you know some of the systems uh, that have been under development for a really long time. Um, you know those those uh those deadlines now keep keep moving and um it'll be quite a long time before i concur this isn't just an irs problem i mean i yeah. i i i know that when i first started with the government doe it was the contractors running everything and the, the managers trusted the contractors more than their staff and my daughter, who's a PMF right now with the government, she's running into the same thing where the contractors are running the show and uh, she can't understand it. it. makes no sense at all. Yeah, it's and it, and that I think there's a risk there. And maybe that's where I want to go to Jessica to talk about the strategic operating plan. Like what is GAO going to be? I know you've got a bunch of projects going on. So what are some of the prime primary ones that you're going to be looking at to making sure that you know, the strategic operating plan for the IRA funds are actually, is actually on course. Yeah, we're still working through trying to figure out, you know, sort of what, what all we're going to be looking at over the next several years, but um, definitely already we're looking uh, as part of our annual review of the filing season, we're looking at um, the extent to which the, the funds can be used or are being used um, to, to help enhance the, the filing season and make the operations go more smoothly, um, looking at um, sort of the, the budget process and, and how this uh, operating plan fits into that. Um, you know, what, what are the requests? How are they prioritized? Um, we're going to probably be looking, I think, at, you know, sort of the, um, again, the, you know, I mentioned the, the challenge in fitting this operating plan, which is sort of both at a, at a program level and at a higher level with the, the objectives, the overall objectives. How does this fit into the other plans that the IRS has developed in the past, whether it be that for our, for um, IT modernization or for um, the, in response to the, the Taxpayer First Act, you know, they had this whole strategic vision going forward and, and lack of funding sometimes was, was um, one of the, the areas where it was uh, difficult to actually implement. And so, you know, we'll be looking at now, and now that they've got this in place, um, to what extent does it address some of the, the priorities and challenges that, that we and TIGTA and others have identified in the past? Um, and you know, where, uh, where is the, the oversight and the accountability? How is that all working? So it's, it's I think, uh, certainly going to be um, a lot uh, to, of different, different avenues to look at. Um, I think I'd mentioned uh, earlier, you know, talking about audits. Um, that's another place that we'd be looking in terms of 
um, you know, how, how is this affecting IRO's um, audit plans, audit rates, uh, effects on different populations. That's something that's been, that's been of, of great interest. Um, but uh, one thing I wanted to mention is that, um, you know, GAO's uh, has this high risk list and um, our air update of high risk issues is gonna be coming out probably next week. And the enforcement of tax laws is one of those things that's been on the high risk list since we started doing it in the 1990s, um, in part because it, it, enforcement of tax laws is a very complex thing. Um, but uh, you know, some of these challenges that we've talked about are, are things that, that we're um, going to be looking at the, the uh, IRA strategic operating plan and the extent to which it addresses um, and, and would allow IRS to be able to better tackle some of the things around customer experience and around return on investment and improving audit quality, um, addressing the tax <clears throat> gap, measures in place, improving voluntary compliance, um, getting away from, from paper to the extent that it can and, and trying to really modernize uh, and move things more effectively, more efficiently, cut down on, on opportunities for fraud. So there's a whole, a whole wealth of different um, chances out there. So maybe, Ursula, I'll ask you this as a closing question for you, which is if you had the ability to change the IRS appropriation categories, how would you organize it to make it more holistic? I mean, that's a tough one, Nina, because, you know, I, I, I have trouble with the whole concept of separating taxpayer service from enforcement. But on the other hand, if you were to put it all into one appropriation account, which what they would say we're proposing doing, I think maybe in 2004 or something like that, then you wind up in a situation where you have these budget account activities or budget activities where you have even less flexibility between the different um, accounts than you, than you have between appropriations. So um, I, I really don't know. Um, yeah. yeah. Mark, any weighing in on that or any final words you want to say on this issue? No, I just think uh, that uh, GAO is going to have their hands full looking at uh, IRS going forward, especially with the, the IRA funds. And the, the, the points Jessica was making about the you know, dozen or so plans that are out there that need to be coordinated somehow is going to be a big challenge to the IRS management team going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, be helpful to do like a crosswalk of them all to kind of see, you know, but it would probably look like the Enron charts or something. <laughs> one of the things, Nina, I, I'd like to say is that um, at one point around the time I was leaving, we had a uh, proposal where the, the, the service organizations would charge the businesses for their services. Yeah, that's interesting. And that, and, and I was, vehemently opposed to this particular <laughs> process or uh, proposal, um, although Treasury was on board and my boss was on board because they believed that this would improve efficiency. Um, if, you're, if you're charging people for your services, you would become more efficient. Well, that's bullshit. Uh, it only works if you've got competitors and <laughs> no competitors to um, the business units funded by operations support, you have no choice but the IT organization of the IRS to buy your IT. So where these improvements were going to come from, it was beyond me. And all I could see was it would lead to much more frustration and inter-business unit squabbling. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it would be a disaster, I, I, I think. I think. Um, so... Whatever yeah. we do with these appropriation counts, yeah. I don't want to set us up in a situation where I think we'd be worse off than we are now. That's that's a really, really interesting point. So I want to just address the one other question that we had was, can anything anyone do anything about the 2019 returns that haven't been processed mm -hmm. and the time period for getting refunds is almost up? And my response to you is file a refund suit in federal district court. Um, okay, you know, that gets you at least you're within the time frame and that gets you moving because it's been six months since you filed your refund return. Um, and that will at least you'll have told that clock. Um, 
So with that, there, we will be, this is being recorded and it will be up on our website. And all of you who have registered, we'll also be sending you out the link to the YouTube video of this. It will probably be by the end of this weekend, Monday or maybe Tuesday, since Monday's tax day. Um, so um, I just want to thank our wonderful group of guests. They've really made a topic that maybe some people thought wasn't interesting very, very interesting. So thank you all. And I hope you tune in next Tuesday, where we will take up another topic, um, the IT challenges. And then in another week or so, we'll be going to um, talk about the IRS workforce and some of the challenges there. And we'll have representatives from NTEU and actually a member of the oversight board who used to be, um, Bob Tobias, who used to be on NTEU. And then we're going to have um, an anthropologist who's going to talk about um, the Swedish tax agency and some of the changes that went on there as they tried to look at the culture of that agency a while ago. So I mean, if we wanted to watch these things, do we have to register somewhere? I think you're registered, but Ursula, you would, but if not, we'll get you registered. Thank you, because I, okay. I, I'd like to listen in on these. Good. Well, there are about 13 more of these, so <laughs> yay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all. This is great. I hope we made things a little less confusing, but we'll see. At least you know things to look for when you, the IRS puts a budget out and particularly look for the budget and brief document because um, that will at least give you some information. But then you also know some questions to ask. Okay. Thank you all. And we'll see you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.